I know this getting toward the end of the week, your endurance is being tried, your, uh, you've stuffed a lot into your heads, I hope, this week, and um, hopefully it'll stick. Um, what I've been tasked with here is uh, a discussion of the economics of medical care, which of course in the last several years, partic particularly with the advent of the so-called Affordable Care Act, there's been a lot of um, concern about the American medical care system and what needs to change, and most people do think some, some kind of change is in order. And uh, I'd like to give a, a bit of a perspective on this that's consistent with markets, it's consistent with the um, Austrian view of how markets work. Um, and I'd like to do this in two parts. First, I'd like to spend some time on bureaucracy and medical information, and then later we'll spend some time on the uh, effects of third-party payers in the medical care system, insurance, government. Uh, most people in the United States are paying um, a small fraction of the total bill out of their own pockets. Most people don't even have a good idea of how much their insurance costs because their employer uh, would provide their insurance and that may not show up as a deduction off of their paycheck, at least not the entire amount. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ignorance about what people are really paying for medical services and um, I, I am going to talk a little bit about comparisons between the United States and us other countries, but I hope you don't get the impression that I'm trying to uh, uh, set this up as some kind of comparison of a free market system versus those um, nasty socialists in other countries, because our medical care system, as I think I can show you today, is um, pretty well um, uh, socialized at least in some regards. We've just had a, a lot of bureaucracy overtake medical care, particularly since the 1960s. Um, let me quickly go through one of the problems that has beset medical care, and I'm going to overlap a bit with, with um, Bob Higgs' talk this week on the FDA, but I will mention just a few things here that I think are pertinent in trying to understand the information problems affecting regulators. You know about the socialist calculation problem by this point in the week. You've heard mention of the difficulties that governments have in uh, weighing costs and benefits and coming up with information sufficient to make good decisions, even if they were so inclined to make good decisions. So there's a separate problem of their incentives and their inclinations, and um, even if they had good information, uh, would they use that for the benefit of the public? So there's two separate problems, and I think that the problem of, of uh, drug regulation is a good example of that. The FDA approval process has changed over time. In 1906, there was a law passed that said medications should not contain substances harmful to health. By 1938, the manufacturers were also required to demonstrate safety. And we know safety is a, it's not an either or binary condition. It's varying levels of safety. Um, pretty much anything you put in your body will do damage if you take enough of it. And that's true of medications. Um, but the law says now the government's got to supervise uh, safety in, in medications. And then in 1962, the Food and Drug Act was modified to uh, require pharmaceutical companies to prove safety and effectiveness. Uh, again, effectiveness varies, and um, it's, a, it's not an either-or. But uh, again, the government was supposed to make sure you didn't put something into your body that they didn't think was appropriate, according to their standards. Prior to 1962, the FDA was, a, was required to, a, to approve a substance within 180 days unless it was not proven safe. 
So they had a limited amount of time. After 1962, that time constraint was completely removed, and now the uh, drug approval process has greatly lengthened. It now takes many years from the time that a drug is submitted to the FDA before it will be approved for public consumption. Uh, prior to 1962, the time from filing to approval averaged about seven months. By 1967, it had gone to 30 months, and by the late 1970s, it had gone to eight to 10 years. The testing cost rose along with that so that now it's somewhere around $800 million for each new drug. And if you uh, take into account the fact that a lot of drugs um, that start off in the laboratory don't make it to the FDA uh, or they fail at some point along the approval process, then the average cost of bringing a drug to market is somewhere in the billions, uh, a, a drug that actually is approved by the FDA. And this creates significant ba uh, barriers to entry. For example, there was a case I read of some years ago in which a uh, doctor at the Boston Children's Hospital was trying to get um, a nutritional supplement for newborn babies that had liver problems. Uh, they were premature, and, and the, there's a kind of a catch-22 situation, apparently, with newborn children with liver problems. You have to feed them um, intravenously because their digestive tract isn't mature. But if you feed them intravenously for too long, then uh, they get liver problems. And so he had found something that they were using in Europe that was pretty effective, but the company would not even file with the FDA to try to get approval in the United States of this substance. It was available only on a trial basis here. Uh, they couldn't mass market the substance, nutritional supplement or whatever it was. Um, and they, they weren't gonna try because they said, look, We've got something else in the pipeline. It's going to take us a few years to get it, but if we're going to spend the money to get the FDA approval, we're going to spend it on this other thing. Uh, so it, it effectively kept the effective uh, alternative um, out of the U.S. market, and it's, it's difficult to know how many uh, patients were adversely affected by that kind of thing. You can come up with some other examples here, like Septra, which is an antibiotic. There was about a five-year delay, at least, in introducing that to the U.S. market. And one estimate by George Hitchings, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, is that this delay cost about 80,000 lives in the United States. And we don't know exactly who they, who they were, of course. You don't know who would have been saved and who would not have been, but um, there is a substantial cost to this. Beta blockers. Um, I've talked to physicians, some of which say beta blockers really weren't that great a thing anyway, um, but most physicians seem to think that it's nice to have them on the market, and uh, the lag in the FDA approval of beta blockers may have cost, by one estimate, 250,000 lives in the United States. So the FDA will say, well, we're protecting people against uh, some awful substance that might have made it onto the market, and see, we saved some lives. But they're also costing lives, and there's very little attention paid to that. You can, of course, go to Bob Higgs book um, on FDA regulation, which I recommend on this topic if you want more. Also, if you advertise for an already approved drug, that you want to use for a newly discovered purpose, then that can violate FDA rules. Some companies will not then find it worthwhile to revisit the approval process for a new use. Uh, my understanding is that even thalidomide, which got this, uh, this uh, terrible reputation, um, is now being used for some other purpose in the United States, just not for pregnant women. It was originally introduced, I think, as a drug for morning sickness in pregnant women, and um, now it's being used for something very different. Um, you can come up with a lot of examples of that kind of thing. We had this drug. Uh, it was bad for this use, but it might be good for something else. The new use, whatever it is, might be relatively unknown. So, um, and this is from Tom DiLorenzo's article, which you can find on, on the Mises Daily on the Mises.org website. He says, new drugs do consumers no good if they do not know about them. Advertising restrictions imposed by the FDA therefore prop up the profits of incumbent drug marketers at the expense of newcomers in the industry and, of course, consumers. Now, that's, of course, the point 
of these barriers to entry. The whole point of the FDA is to keep drugs off the market. Now, the average Joe on the street probably says, well, that's good because otherwise there'd be rat poison in my aspirin, but uh, the reason for the, for the barrier is to protect the existing manufacturers against some new innovative competitor. Here's an example of this. In 1988, there was a meeting in the offices of the FDA commissioner, who at that time was Frank Young, and all companies making aspirin were told that they could not advertise the benefits of the product in reducing risks for first heart attacks. If they did, the FDA would bring legal action. As a consequence, the ban on aspirin advertising undoubtedly causes tens of thousands of needless deaths per year. That's from Thomas Sowell's book, Applied Economics. Uh, he's got a great chapter in there on medical or healthcare economics, and he talks about the FDA and some other aspects of medical care. Now, when we're talking about information, whether it's the information that we want, want the, the pharmaceutical companies to use when trying to develop innovative new drugs or the information we want a doctor to have and to employ when trying to decide on a treatment for a patient or a diagnosis for a patient, we have to consider how that knowledge, that medical knowledge, is going to um, get to the relevant decision makers. And it's important to remember something that Hayek pointed out, that there is a kind of knowledge which you cannot put into statistical form. You might not even be able to articulate it in words, but it is relevant knowledge. Uh, my father was a physician for many, many years, and he would say there's all kinds of things that a doctor can find out about a patient in an uh, ordinary office examination that don't have anything to do with the outcome of a test. Um, we, and you, sometimes you see a science fiction movie where there'll be a robot taking care of a patient and taking a blood sample or um, probing or something and, and the, the robot comes up with a diagnosis. And that's silly, of course, because there are so many things about that human being in front of you that have to be taken into account to make a good decision. Um, and, this problem is magnified by the fact that medical care is now becoming increasingly bureaucratized so that there are multiple third parties who are trying to intrude into that relationship between the doctor and the patient and second guess the doctor's decisions. Are you sure, doctor, that it really should have been this diagnosis? I mean, we, we're looking at the numbers on the lab test that you gave and we noticed that the, the numbers are this or that. And, and we noticed that you gave this lab test instead of that lab test. And it's the government, it's the insurance companies, and, um, and, and on a micro scale, the hospitals themselves who are under pressure from accreditation and other kinds of third party agencies looking at that meeting between the doctor and the patient and trying to figure out what was going on when they were not in the room. They're a thousand miles away. And there's relevant information that cannot be understood or absorbed by those third parties. Um, Conco and Arnett in a 2008 article say that thousands of physicians and patients every day make myriad choices from available drug options. They take into account differences in effectiveness, side effects, and drug interactions for each individual patient. FDA scientists may know a lot about the drugs they evaluate and their average effects on thousands of users, but they know nothing about the individualized physiology of each patient. On the other hand, intensively trained clinical physicians who do have knowledge of individual patients are best able to advise them if a drug is appropriate. Can we really assess the quality of a doctor-patient encounter from a distance. There are risks to trying to do this. Uh, for one thing, if you try to uh, uh, distill everything about that encounter into a code, you're going to miss some things. Um, there are these, uh, I think it's called current procedural terminology for CPT codes that um, miss uh, circumstantial information that might be important. So doctors, in a lot of cases, are forced to choose, do I want to comply with the uh, 
standards being imposed from a distance or do I want to meet the needs of this patient that's sitting in front of me? And that's a terrible dilemma for a physician who knows what needs to be done but is restrained from doing that by the fact that what needs to be done is not going to look like what needs to be done from a thousand miles away. So uh, conscientious doctors are frequently encouraged, not officially of course, but encouraged by their own sense of morality in the situation to bend or break the rules to help patients. And so the rules end up becoming, and the penalties end up becoming more and more draconian to try to discourage doctors from doing what they think is best. Ludwig von Mises, in his book, Bureaucracy, which is another great book, it's not one of his longer ones, and it's a good introduction to some of the problems of bureaucracy, said government must be formalistic and rigid by its nature. The core problem is the lack of a measure of success or failure. You don't have a profit loss signal to indicate when you're being efficient in your use of resources. So uh, sort of like uh, traffic cops, you know, you get pulled over and uh, the, the cop comes up to your window and says, um, do you know how fast you were going? And I'm not sure I know what the correct response is that you're supposed to give to try to get out of the ticket, but you, you're supposed to say something like, well, I, I mean, it's a trap really, right? I mean, if you say, I don't know, that means you weren't paying attention. If you say, well, yes, I, I know, and then you were intentionally breaking the law, well, the cop doesn't really care too much about what your intentions were or what your purpose was, whether you were speeding because uh, you're you know, having to get to the hospital to see your sick mother or something. It's, oh, well, the speed limit is 55, you were doing 58 QED, it's just, that's it. And the officer is really a bureaucrat in the situation. Any circumstantial information may be ignored. So Mises says it's pointless to try to complain about this kind of thing because this is the nature of bureaucracy. If you don't want something to be treated that way, take it out of the bureaucracy. Take it out of the government's hands. But that's the nature of government. Here's an example of this. Um, the AAPS, by the way, is, is the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, I think their website is aaps dash online.com, I think, or .org, I can't remember now. Um, it's a great organization. I spoke at one of their conferences last fall in Denver, and um, they have a journal where they're, they're quoting Rothbard, and they're quoting um, um, a lot of Austrian types, and, and these are physicians who are very, very serious about free markets. It's a great free market alternative to the AMA. And uh, if you're involved in, in medicine, I encourage you to, to look them up, or if you've got maybe relatives or something that are involved in this kind of thing, they're a great organization. And um, in their journal, uh, they reported on a survey of doctors, this is some years ago, but I think it's still interesting, regarding Medicare fraud. And they found that the, the rules basically make fraud uh, uh, very difficult to avoid. Um, they, they define fraud as an error. They assume that if you made an error, then you must have been trying to defraud the, the government. And unintentional errors are virtually unavoidable. And 82% 80, of those responding to the survey said they reported increased fear of prosecution or investigation in the past three years. 71% reported making changes in their practice to avoid the threat of prosecution, including greatly restricting services. Uh, more than a third of all the respondents restricted services to Medicare patients, like surgery, because they were concerned with what would happen if they were um, uh, charged with some kind of fraudulent behavior. So rather than try to navigate the minefield, they just say, well, I'm not going in the minefield. I'm, I'm just going to stay, stay clear of the whole problem. 20% reported they did not accept new Medicare patients because of hassles or threats from Medicare. Almost a fourth do not accept new Medicare patients. Of those who do, 9% do so only under special circumstances. Uh, more than a third have 
trouble finding physicians willing to accept referrals of their Medicare patients, and more than a fourth who do restrict services to Medicare patients. Oh, I said this already. They do this because of hassles and threats from Medicare. There was a study from uh, what I think is now called the General Account Government Accountability Office or something like that. It used to be Accounting Office. And uh, anyway, the GEA GAO re reported that um, in 2002, 85% of the time, Medicare customer service representatives gave the wrong answer to questions posed by physicians regarding the proper way to bill Medicare. You've heard this maybe about the IRS. You call the IRS and you say, well, how should I fill out this, my tax form? And they'll give you an answer, but they're not held to uh, account if they give you the wrong answer. I mean, you, you take their advice, you put down the stuff, and you turn in your tax form, and you get audited, and, and, and uh, you're found that to have committed an error on this point, and you say, well, I called you, and you told me to do this, and that's sorry, that's no excuse. Well, the same thing apparently is happening with Medicare. Uh, they're giving the wrong answers to these questions. Well, so the, then the government said, okay, we're, we're going to improve. We will fix this. We are sorry. So then they did a follow-up study in 2004, two years of improvement, 96% of the time, <laughs> Medicare customer service representatives gave the wrong answer. All right, so I, I guess, you know, you could call up Medicare and say, well, what should I do? And whatever they tell you, do the opposite because it's more likely to be correct. Uh, so these regulations are so confusing that even the people that are supposed to be explaining them as, a, as their job to doctors uh, can't, can't do so reliably. So we get a number of competing uh, incentives here. The, the hospitals have an incentive to cycle the Medicare Medicaid patients through as fast as possible because they're paid only for the diagnosis, not for the treatments that follow. The physicians have an incentive to keep the patient in longer and do more tests, do more therapy, because that's how they're paid. So uh, there's a a conflict here, and doesn't mean that it's going to balance out so that the patient stays in about the right amount of time. Uh, sometimes they're going to be uh, out too early, sometimes they're going to be in too long, and that's all. A lot of this is changing under the health care reforms so that uh, hospitals are facing very high penalties now for readmissions under the ACA. And so they are uh, keeping people in longer than they would otherwise to make sure they're okay before they leave. Now, that may mean that some people stay too long because the hospital is trying to make sure it's not uh, falling afoul of some, some uh, ACA penalty. Let's talk a little bit about rising costs. Uh, Boyapati says there's four reasons for rising medical care costs, and they are basically employer-provided health care insurance, licensure, the obesity epidemic in the United States particularly, and intellectual property. Um, I'll mention here that, that employer-provided health care insurance is very much a product of our tax system in the United States. Um, in 1943, our marginal tax rate, income tax rate for individuals was extremely high. It, it rose rapidly during the war. I think by the end of the war, the top marginal tax rate was somewhere around 97% in the United States, uh, which means that, in, and that those high tax rates persisted until the Kennedy tax cuts about 20 years after the war. So employers who wanted to compensate their employees had an incentive to provide fringe benefits or in-kind compensation rather than cash compensation, which would be taxed. So one of the ways they found to do this was to simply provide a uh, to provide health care uh, uh, medical care insurance for their employees, and that was paid from pre-tax dollars, so that the employee would receive a, um, uh, a more more money than they would have received if they had been paid cash, gotten it taxed, and then paid the premiums out of their own pockets. Medical care licensure is also very uh, important as a restriction on entry into the medical care field. There are certain things that a nurse might be very well capable of doing, but is restricted by law from doing. And so uh, each medical uh, specialty has its 
turf that it tries to protect with licensure. Uh, there is this obesity epidemic. Um, uh, one, of, one of the things that you sometimes hear is that um, the American medical care system must be broken because um, Americans have this life expectancy that's lower, we have higher rates of this or that or the other thing, and that must be because of the medical profession. Well, I don't know how much control my doctor has over my weight, but I'd, I'd suggest it's not much. I mean, my doctor can suggest that I should lose weight, or my doctor can suggest that I exercise, but to lay American health problems at the feet of the medical profession is, I think, a bit unfair. Americans also have higher accident rates than some other countries. And furthermore, um, if you look at certain categories of um, illness and disease, like, um, well, uh, uh, newborn illnesses um, and deaths are sometimes counted differently in different countries. Some countries, they, if, a, if an infant dies, they don't count that as a as a, uh, a death, and so they don't count that against the life expectancy of that country. So um, we're not really comparing apples to apples when we're looking across different countries on something like life expectancy. And it's, again, I think it's unfair to charge American doctors with all of the healthcare problems that we see in the United States. Um, so one of the reasons I think that, that we're seeing rising costs is that we see these intermediaries interposing themselves between the patient and the doctor. Um, care providers, some doctors don't like that term because it sort of lumps them in with other providers like, I don't know. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lump, find a term for doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners and everybody else, that group uh, starts looking to satisfy the insurance company or the bureaucrat from Medicare rather than satisfying the patient. And this produces a large number of problems. There are basically two problems that you can observe with, um, with third-party payers. One is the moral hazard problem. Moral hazard, you, if you're taking economics courses at some point, you've heard of this. It's basically the idea that if somebody else is paying for your mistakes, you're going to make more mistakes. Um, so in, in terms of medical care, it's the risk or the hazard that the insured person might engage in activities that are undesirable. We can call that immoral uh, for moral hazard that are undesirable from the insur insurer's point of view because they make it more likely the claims are going to be larger. Um, if I have car insurance that insures me against uh, hail damage, then I'm more likely to leave my car outside when there's a storm because I know that if my car gets ruined with chunks of ice falling from the sky, then somebody else is going to pay the bill. Now, I do care about my deductible, and so that may give me enough of an incentive to behave um, appropriately in that case. But insurance tends to create this, make, tends to make patients behave differently than they would otherwise. Also, there's a principal agent problem. Those who are charged with acting on behalf of the patient, the patient being the principal, have their own objectives, their own goals, and they're not necessarily compatible with those of the patient. Now let's talk a little bit about um, cosmetic surgery. I was doing a paper recently on medical care costs, and I ran across this information on cosmetic surgery costs. I pick on cosmetic surgery because it's less likely to be insured kinds of procedures. And there's a lot of kind of minimally invasive cosmetic surgery that's something like Botox injections or um, collagen or something like that, and it's, it's outpatient, it's pretty, pretty basic. And then there's more substantial uh, cosmetic surgery, which we won't get into now. Um, and then there's uh, other similar kinds of services like laser eye surgery. It's not really cosmetic surgery, but it's, um, it's treated similarly in a lot of ways. Um, 
Laser eye surgeons, according to one source I have, rarely accept insurance, and therefore you get some similar outcomes as you do with cosmetic surgery. Now here's a graph that shows what's happened with medical care costs. This is labeled nominal health care inflation. This is from Devin Herrick's article from the National Center for Policy Analysis, and uh, he's got several really good articles on this topic. And you'll see medical care costs from 1992 to about, to about 2012 went up 118%. Uh, physician services up about 92%. The overall level of inflation um, going from the, I think the CPI, yes, the CPI, 64% uh, over that period of time. And then cosmetic services, only about 30%, less than the rate of inflation. The real cost of a lot of cosmetic surgery has dropped. Um, and yet, if you look at the technology that's used and the procedures that are done, the quality of these procedures has often increased. For example, uh, laser surgery has become faster and more precise. Um, eye surgeons have found that their patients are very careful shoppers, unlike doctors who are working with insured patients or government pay patients. Um, one doctor who's a LASIK provider named Brian Bonani, this is again from um, Devin Herrick's article, explains he must tell potential patients exactly how much the service is going to cost because patients tend to shop around when they are using their own money. Dr. Bonani also notes that many patients will see three or more doctors before making a decision. You're also seeing market-oriented general surgery centers that are, that are doing um, orthopedic surgery and other kinds of surgery that um, attracts patients from across the country. When I was at the AAPS meeting in, uh, last fall in, in, in Denver, I um, listened to a presentation by a couple of doctors who are running a, a surgery center in Oklahoma. In fact, it's called the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, <laughs> which um, attracts patients from all over. They, they have a website, you can look it up, some of you probably already have, and you're, um, you, you get a price list. And you, um, you can call them up, you can pay a deposit, you go out there, you get a uh, kind of an examination, they tell you, yes, you're a candidate for the surgery, or no, you're not. And, uh, it's, and I, you know, listen to these guys, they're very enthusiastic about what they're doing, and they're fully aware of the benefits of introducing self-pay into the medical practice. Uh, they're very free market oriented guys and they know what they're doing. Um, and they, their quality is very high. I mean, the infection rates are about two orders of magnitude less than the national average. The infection rates are kind of a benchmark for a lot of surgery. They want, you want to find out what the quality of surgery is? We'll find out how many patients get infect, infections post-surgery. Two orders of magnitude. What's that? One one-hundredth or something. So we're getting competing standards, and the patient is getting lost. And the patient's priorities are getting lost. You have the patient who wants the care provider to do something. The employer receives competing bids from insurance companies, and once in a while they'll swap out insurance companies. You get government that, you know, patients can vote, and at least um, on the surface they look like they have some kind of, kind of say, which I think is more of an illusion, but it's, they, they, they get to pretend that they have some kind of impact on what government does, and then uh, governments regulate the care providers, and then the insurance companies are lobbying the government, and the government's regulating the insurance companies, and the insurance companies are providing these efficiency standards onto the, onto the doctors and the hospitals and the nurses. Now, if you look at the, um, uh, the money, you're going you're to expect the doctor to pay attention to wor the, the person who's providing most of the money. Well, 45 to 50% is coming from the government. About 40% or so is coming from insurance, 
and only around 10 or 15 percent, maybe less by now, is coming out of the patient's own pocket. And now, once you introduce the um, Affordable Care Act, I, I have trouble with those words coming out of my mouth, but uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, you get this. Okay, so here you've got, let's see, the federal <laughs> government's going to mandate that the patient get insurance, health insurance, the government taxes patients, they provide subsidies to patients, the federal government issues mandates on employers, um, if you're over a certain number of employees, you have to have insurance. We just saw this, this um, high-profile Hobby Lobby case that um, came out about the, the, you know, whether or not the government can force a corporation to include certain things in their insurance packages for employees. Uh, then the federal government's got these exchanges. Some states have set up their own state exchanges. Some states, like my state, have said, no, we're not going to do this. So you get a federal exchange, and then there's the regulations and eligibility requirements imposed on these exchanges. Uh, it's just, at, and, and this is a simplified diagram. Um, <laughs> here's the, <laughs> here's uh, one that I picked up from uh, type so small, and they had so much to fit in there, you know, it's kind of hard to see where. If you're interested, I can probably find you the source on this. I'm sorry? Galen Institute. Galen Institute is the one that came up with this then. Um, and it, it, it's, it's really so complex. I mean, this is a 2,800-page piece of regulation. Um, it, it requires insurance companies to cover a greater number of services. It forces individuals who don't already own government or employee-provided insurance to buy their own or pay a penalty, it expands Medicaid, it reduces the autonomy of health care providers, which is very serious. I mean, you may think, well, I, you know, that's just doctors. They just want to be able to do what they want and nobody telling them what to do. Well, you start interfering with the way doctors run their practices, and a lot of doctors are going to say, I'm not going to do this anymore. And they back out of the medical profession probably with some of the best ones leaving first. So you get doctors that exit, and then you're left with fewer doctors and less access to medical care as a result of this. Uh, so these features of the Affordable Care Act aggravate the problem of moral hazard for people who remain insured. That tends to push prices higher. Uh, it requires insurers to cover pre-existing conditions, which violates the very principle of insurance. Um, can, you, can you imagine um, I call up an insurance agent and say, hey, I'd like to buy some fire insurance on my house. And he says, oh, well, we'll send somebody out in a week to uh, do an appraisal of your house and figure out how much the premium is going to be. And I'll say, well, actually, I need it right now because there's a fire in my kitchen. So, um, we can already see the impact of some of this. Now, insurance companies have gotten very worried about what's going to happen. They're being forced to take on uh, a, a risk that they're not really sure about. Uh, they don't know what the risk is exactly, and so premiums have already started to rise. Obama, when he was back when he was running for the office he now holds, um, promised during his campaign that the average family would see medical insurance premiums drop by about $2,500 a year. I was reading a report a few weeks ago based on data that's come out in 2014 that indicates that the average family premium for employer-sponsored coverage has risen by $3,700, 3671 actually. Now, supporters of the Amer uh, Affordable Care Act have argued that there's been a recent slowdown in the growth rate of medical care expenditures. And if you look at the graphs, you can see, well, the growth rate of medical care expenditures has dropped over the last 
uh, several years. Now this started, this, this declining trend in the growth rate started well before this Affordable Care Act. So trying to take, have the Affordable Care Act take credit for this is a little bit um, difficult. But uh, they're, they're, the, the supporters will say, well, there's penalties imposed now on hospitals for readmissions, and that means that the hospitals, because readmissions are expensive, we're, we're cutting back on costs that way. Um, and, and if you look at the data from about 2010 through about 2013, the growth rate annually in national health care expenditures was only about 1.3%, which is a lot lower than the growth rate you saw from about 2000 to 2007. There was a drop during the recession, and a lot of this is due to the recession, but um, we, we haven't seen much of an increase um, in, in recent years, and, and the growth rate seems to have stayed um, fairly low. Now, uh, Michael Tanner, who does work with Cato on some of this, did a study in which um, he says, well, probably what's happened is that the Amer Affordable Care Act slowed or stopped a separate trend toward low growth in medical expenses. Um, a, um, another a, a report from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services showed lower estimates for future spending, and they said it's not due to the ACA, it's due to other things. It's due to um, um, uh, technological improvements and, uh, and a few other, uh, other factors. Now, other people have, seen, uh, have looked at the ACA and they say, well, you know, there could be a silver lining in this. As disastrous as this may be, there could be a positive, inadvertent effect of the Affordable Care Act. And that is that it pushes Americans toward higher deductible insurance plans. Now, higher deductible insurance plans have been available for a long time, and you would sometimes take out one of these high deductible plans and enjoy a lower premium because of this. But lately, we're getting high deductible plans, and sometimes that's the only option the, the employer provides. And we're not seeing the savings on insurance premiums as a result. Um, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a survey last year where they found that 17% of employers at that time offered a high deductible health, player, health plan as the only option for employees. This is a um, one-third increase over 2012, and more than 44% of employers reported they were considering offering it as the only option. So it looks like this is going to be a significant increase in high deductible plans. Now, this, where's the silver lining in all of this? Well, the silver lining is that if people have high deductible plans, that means more of what they spend is coming out of their own pocket, which makes them more careful shoppers. Now, I don't think that that feature of, or that effect of the, it's not a feature really, because it wasn't intended apparently, but that, I don't think that that effect of the Affordable Care Act is really going to, to offset all of the damage that's being done with other parts of that 2,800-page regulation. But it is, um, it is something to think about. Uh, in, if you look at deductibles, in, if you're looking for an in-network physician, in 2009, those in-network deductibles averaged about $680. In 2013, they had gone to $1,230, almost doubling. Out-of-network deductibles, um, more than doubled over the same time period. So we're seeing Americans paying higher deductibles um, over time. I don't have a lot of time left, but I want to talk a little bit about national medical care systems. Now, if you are looking at an ordinary supply and demand diagram, you can see downward sloping line here. If the equilibrium price is here and we're relying on the market to... Uh, to allocate medical care, then prices are going to be here, the quantity provided is going to be about here. Now, if you tell people, as some countries have tried to do, that 
your medical care is uh, going to be zero cost to you out of pocket, then at a zero price, the quantity demanded is going to be way over here. Now, you can't provide that much medical care. I mean, you could, you could overwhelm the, I mean, you could have everybody in the country working in the medical care field, and you wouldn't be able to provide as much as people will want if the cost is, if the price is truly zero. So what the government will then do is start to ration medical care according to some criteria of its own. Um, Miller, Benjamin, and North, in their little book on, um, I've forgotten the title of it now, but it's a little microeconomics paperback that I use in classes sometimes, say that a single government agency in each country acts as a monopsony buyer of health care services on behalf of everyone. Individuals are either prevented from buying health care on their own or are limited by government rules as to what they may buy. Like other, other monopsonies, these health, national health insurance systems force down the prices of the goods they buy, such as drugs, medical services, and physicians and nurses services. This in, in turn reduces the quantities of those goods and services that suppliers will provide, particularly in the long run. So, Americans sometimes look at the Canadians and they say, well, look, the drugs, the pharmaceutical products in, in, in Canada are, are so cheap. We should be like Canada. You know, my, my friend in Canada, he, he, gets, he gets drugs for such a low price. I mean, why can't we do that? Well, what's, what Canada's doing is basically saying you, can't, is saying you can't sell your drug here unless you agree to sell it at this very low price price, which may be close to marginal cost for the, uh, for the drug company. Well, making drugs is a high fixed cost, very low marginal cost industry. Most of the cost is involved in figuring out what the formula is and the production process is. Once you got that figured out, you can churn them out like making copies, photocopies or something. It's, it's pretty cheap to do that once you, most of the time. Once you've got that process done. The billions of dollars that you spent as a pharmaceutical company are in developing the ability to produce the first one. All right. So what Canada and, and other countries that do this kind of thing are doing is, is saying, well, you know, we're not going to help you repay those fixed costs. Well, so far in the United States, uh, market prices are more often allowed to prevail and so the pharmaceutical companies recover those fixed costs here, and then in other markets around the world, they sell these things at, at marginal cost. Well, that is not a recipe for innovation. And if pharmaceutical companies cannot charge a price that uh, allows them to recover their upfront costs, they're not going to innovate to create new drugs. They're going to figure they, they're not going to be able to recover the cost. Why start? Why spend the billions of dollars up front if we can't make that back? So less health care ends up being provided. Yuri Maltsev wrote a great article um, several years ago. I think it appeared as a Mises Daily. And um, uh, I think I put it on the reading list for this talk. And he says, the Brookings Institution found that every year 7,000 Britons in need of hip replacements, between 4 and 20,000 in need of coronary bypass surgery, cabbage surgery, and some 10 to 15,000 in need of cancer chemotherapy are denied medical attention in Britain. Age discrimination is particularly apparent in all government-run or heavily regulated systems of health care. In Russia, which he should know about, Patients over 60 are considered worthless parasites, and those over 70 are often died even denied even elementary forms of health care. In the UK, in the treatment of chronic kidney failure, those who are 55 years old are refused treatment at 35% of dialysis centers. 45% of 65-year-old patients at the centers are denied treatment, and patients 75 or older rarely receive any medical attention at these centers. In Canada, the population is divided into three age groups in terms of their access to health care. The below 45, the 45 to 65 group, and those over 65. The first group enjoys priority treatment. 
Now, there's been a lot made about how insurance companies deny claims, and they, and they do, and I'm not trying to paint insurance companies as any kind of, uh, they may be sort of market entities, but they are rent-seeking and they, they have a whole lot of problems. But if you compare private insurance companies to, say, the government uh, Medicare, Medicaid services, the denial rates on claims are actually higher for Medicare. Uh, Medicare denies 6.85% of its claims, higher than any private insurer. And then you get these effects on the availability of medical care, and we can look at rough numbers on the number of doctors per person, the number of nurses per person, uh, the number of MRI machines per person, and I, I'll just throw a few of these up here on the screen really quick. In 2006, 2.1 practicing physicians per thousand in Canada, 2.4 in the U.S. Canada's got 8.8 .8 practicing nurses per thousand. The U.S. is 10.5. Again, I'm not trying to say, well, this is the free market U.S. compared to the socialist Canadians, because it's the more socialist Canadians and the less socialist so far um, uh, U.S. And I, I'm not even sure we can say that anymore, but this is 2008. Um, Ronald Hamowy spoke at Mises University a couple of years, well, this is three years ago now, and there's a recording on Mises.org of his uh, talk, which is great on Canadian Medicare, um, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at that as well. Medicaid's costs and Medicare's have risen a lot faster than the cost of private health care, even though health care costs for the young have risen faster than those for the old over time. And some people say, well, you know, Medicare is covering older people, and therefore you would expect higher, higher price increases. And, and in fact, that's, um, that works in favor of Medicare, and despite that, they've had higher cost increases. So you can take a look at this. The red line there is combined annual per patient cost of all health care in the U.S. except for Medicare and Medicaid, and the black line is Medicare and Medicaid per patient. So um, in the U.S., where you can make a comparison between a market-based entity and a government-based entity, the government tends to produce higher costs. MRI machines are far more common in the U.S. than in the U.K. and Canada. Uh, CT scanners, about the same. Um, if you look at the UK, they've got a higher rate of death from heart attack, stroke, and cancer than the US. Canada, it's higher rates for heart attacks and cancer. Cancer survival rates are better in the US, and wait times are much better in the US than they are in many other countries. You want to wait to get a specialist appointment, you're going to, you're going to wait a long time in countries where the um, medical care system is more uh, government run. I always throw this in at the end of my talk on this, and, and I just kind of have to laugh. I mean, it's kind of a Austin Powers type. You know, the, the British have this kind of apologies for any British in the room, but it's a little, it's a little uh, funny to Americans um, that. Apparently, some English have resorted to pulling out their own teeth because they can't find or can't afford a dentist. Um, Six percent of those questioned in a survey of 5,000 patients admitted they had resorted to self-treatment using pliers and glue. Um, more than three-quarters of those polled said they had been forced to pay for private treatment because they had been unable to find a National Health Services dentist. Almost a fifth said they had refused dental treatment because of the cost. One respondent in Lancashire claimed to have extracted 14 of her own teeth, his, his teeth, I guess, with a pair of pliers. I took most of my teeth out in the shed with pliers. I have one to go. Others said they had fixed broken crowns using glue to avoid costly dental work. Well. Free health care and dental care is great when you can find it. If you can't find it, then you're left to your own devices with kind of grisly results. So um, Valerie Hallsworth says, uh, 
She removed seven of her own teeth using her husband's pliers when her toothache became unbearable and she was unable to find an NHS dentist. And this is, this is a real problem. All right, so to sum up here, pharmaceutical regulation kills people. <laughs> Bureaucracy produces rule-based behavior instead of entrepreneur-directed discretionary behavior, so you get more death and suffering. <clears throat> The principal agent problems emerge as third-party payers separate the patient from the doctor. Moral hazard problems created by third parties increase medical costs, and so you get government rationing of some type. And I know this, is, this looks very, very bad. Um, that's because it is very, very bad. <laughs> it's really no way to sugarcoat the situation. I, although, I will say, I'm encouraged when I see the, the people like the Surgery Center in Oklahoma and others that are really innovating in spite of all of this. And that is encouraging to see. I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at the resilience of the marketplace in spite of all the pressure, all the costs, and the regulations that the government puts on it. I'm really amazed at that, and that there still is innovation there still is progress being made as people invariably find ways to work through all of these uh, difficulties and produce a quality product. So there is, I think, some, some room for um, optimism, but right now, particularly after the ACA, I understand it looks a little dim, uh, uh, dismal. Um, so um, I will stop there, and I think I've got a couple of minutes for questions. Yes. Are you familiar or can you comment on the American Healthcare Reform Act proposed by the Republican Study Committee in the U.S. House, authored by Representative Phil Rose? Um, is this the one that's... Uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a group called... Um, it's run by Bobby Jindal's group that's um, sort of trying to produce um, an alternative to the ACA. It's got some holes like it's maintaining the pre-existing condition exclusion and some other things like that. I, I don't think I know the details of the one you're referring to. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd have to look at it to be able to, to evaluate what I'm seeing. What I what I what is saying? Um, I'm there. There are a lot of groups out there that are wanting to change something about. They 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 profess to hate Obamacare, and then what they what they want to substitute is sort of Obamacare light. And and uh, I'm not saying that Jindal's is, is that way. I've only briefly read what his group suggested, and I, I noticed that it's. It's got a few disturbing um, problems, but it, I, I'd say it's probably an improvement um, over what we've got. Yes? So do you think uh, this is going to be a crisis for the ACA and they will nationalize healthcare? They won't just become like Britain, you know, fully owned? Well, you know, that is the tendency of, um, of regulation. Um, the uh, government creates a problem with its regulation. The problem becomes obvious to everybody, and they say, fix it with some more regulation. And I think this is what Mises observed, that this is how, this is, this is why he said there's no third way. Because a little bit of regulation is gonna to lead to more regulation to fix the problems created by the initial regulation, and you just keep going down this path until you end up with, um, and I'm sure that there are people who are going to look at the failures in the Affordable Care Act, and they're going to say, well, uh, let's just nationalize the whole thing. Now, whether that's politically feasible, I don't know. I mean, I know there's quite a bit of opposition to the Affordable Care Act, but I'm not sure people really understand why it's a pro why the Affordable Care Act has these, these uh, yawning gaps in, in its um, functionality. Yes, in the back. Yes. Okay.
Yeah, well, um, <laughs> that I, could lead to the kind of thing that he's suggesting, that people look at their deductible and say, well, listen, I've got a $5,000 or $10,000 deductible. I don't have that money. Uh, I, I need to have this service, and what am I going to do? And you're going to have enough of those kinds of stories that um, I think you are going to get some calls for increased intervention. Now, you still have Medicare and Medicaid, which don't have that, that high deductible system, but you could find, you, or that high deductible feature, but you could find more and more people pushed into uh, Medicare and Medicaid. Yes? Medical research. Um, to, my, to my knowledge, the two top countries in pharmaceutical research, I don't know about medical research generally, but pharmaceutical research would be the U.S. and Switzerland. And Switzerland's, I haven't looked at, it, at this in some time, but Swi last time I did look, Switzerland's medical care system was structured roughly like the U.S. I think Germany's also. But Switzerland and the U.S. are top in, in pharmaceutical research. I'm afraid I'm out of time, so I'll have to stop. If you have other questions, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards.